Hello and I welcome you to Real Analysis. And as always, first I want to thank all the nice supporters on Steady or PayPal. Now finally, in today's part 34, we will talk about derivatives. More concretely, we will talk about a property of functions we call differentiability. And soon we will learn this has something to do with linearization. If you have never heard of this, then maybe you have read about another notion we call smoothness. Maybe with this one we can immediately start when we look at the function f. To keep it simple, let's choose the domain to be r. And then let's look at a possible graph. This one we wouldn't call smooth because there is a sharp bend here. However, a similar graph like this parabola we would call smooth. Therefore, the first question would be, what does it mean to be smooth? And at this point I can already tell you that differentiability is, like continuity, a pointwise property. Therefore I immediately fix one point and call it x0. So you might already know that differentiability has something to do with the slope at a given point. Hence, do we have a slope for this point and do we have a slope for that point? Now, for getting a value for this slope, we would take a line to approximate this number. So the red line here would be the graph of a linear function where we explicitly have a slope. Hence the question about the slope at a given point is related to the question if we can approximate a function locally with a linear function. And indeed, that's the meaning of the term linearization. Therefore, in the next step, let's look at a linear function. To be more precise, we would call it an affine function, but the term linear function is very common. Maybe also the term linear polynomial would be very fitting. Of course, the important part here is that you know what we mean, so we take a function we call g. This one is given by g of x, where we have a linear part and a constant part. In other words, it's a polynomial where we only have two coefficients involved. In addition, then also the graph looks very simple. Because it's just a straight line. Now it's not hard to see that the slope of this graph is exactly the number a1. Now of course, this is the important ingredient we need for the approximation of a function f. By changing the constant a0, we would just shift the function up and down. For this reason, we don't have a problem changing the expression a little bit when we want to fix a point x0 on the x-axis. Then we would write a constant m times x minus x0 plus a constant c. Then of course m is the same slope we called a1 on the left hand side. Of course for us it's now simpler to give it a new name. However, then this means that in general the constant c is not the same as the constant a0. Indeed, we get that this constant is equal to the value of our function g at the point x0. That's what we can immediately verify when we put in the point. Ok, now this whole thing is an important representation of our linear function you really should remember. You see this because we can use it to get immediately a formula for calculating the slope. In order to do this, let's subtract the constant and divide by x minus x0. Hence we get g of x minus g of x0 divided by x minus x0. And obviously this works no matter what x is, as long as we don't divide by 0. Now because the formula looks like this, it's often called the difference quotient. Ok, now we have everything to do our linear approximation. First let's do it for a function with domain r. And as before we want a local approximation at a given point x0. Therefore, let's look again at the graph of the function. For example, it could look like this. And now we want the linear approximation around this point x0. Now what we can do is to look at any other point x on the x-axis and then take the corresponding point on the graph. And then we just take the line that goes through both points. In general, such a function that has a graph that goes through two points is called a secant. Indeed, we already know how to define this secant here when we call the function s. To make our life a little bit easier, let's call the variable on the x-axis here just t. This means as before, we have the two constants involved we called m and c. The only difference here is that we call the variable now t. However, now we can also put in our knowledge that we already know what m and c actually are. C is the value of s at x0, which is the same as f of x0. 
And similarly, we can put in the slope as f of x minus f of x0 divided by x minus x0. As a reminder, this is exactly what you can visualize here in the graph with a triangle. Then this length here with a sign is the numerator, which means f of x minus f of x0. And the other side is just the denominator. Indeed, that is how you usually calculate slopes. Okay, now going back to our linear approximation, you see this is a linear approximation, but around x0 it's clearly not the best. However, it looks like that it gets better when we push that x closer and closer to x0. So maybe let's visualize that in the next picture. Now I would say let's push the point x here to the left hand side. And now the line that goes through both points looks like a better approximation. Of course, here we are still only interested in a local behavior around x0. We don't care what happens far outside. And now you might already guess, we pushed it even further, such that we have a limit process. Then in this limit we get something out we call the tangent. Still, it's a linear function as the secant, and often it's simply called y. Indeed, now we already know the formula for it. It's simply the secant with a limit in front of it. So you see, we just have the limit x to x0 for the slope. Hence our only requirement for this linear approximation is that this limit exists. And in this case we can call this number the slope of the function at the point x0. Then also in this case we can introduce a nice new symbol. We use the notation f prime of x0 for this limit if it exists. This is very common, but there are also other notations one uses. For example, as a reminder to the difference quotient, one also uses df divided by dx. And then we just put the point x0 afterwards. This whole thing is then called the differential quotient. However, despite its name, it is not a fraction, but just a notation for this limit. Therefore, instead of differential quotient, more often the name derivative is used. Here, please note, in order to write down such a definition, we had to do all the work we did before. We had to define sequences and then the notion to be arbitrarily close to a point. However, in the moment we have this, all of this makes sense and we are able to write down a definition. Now, this is the definition for a function having such a nice linear approximation. Now, let's do it in more generality where the function f has a domain i. Here, please keep in mind, this whole limit process has to make sense. In other words, we need enough points around x0. For example, this will work when we have an interval with more than just x0 as a point. In this case, it could be a closed interval. Or alternatively, we could choose i to be an open set. Because in an open set, all the members inside have a lot of neighbors. So you see, in all of these cases, we can look at this limit. The worst case would then be it does not exist. Okay, then let's fix any function f with domain i and the point x0 from this domain. And now we call this function differentiable at the point x0 if this limit here exists. However, you often see that this whole explanation with the linear approximation is put into the definition. Therefore, I also show you now how this is done. So we introduce a function we call delta with index f and x0. And it is defined with the same domain i. Here please always keep in mind, if we put in an x which is not x0, we always get out the slope of the secant. In other words, in this case it's just a shortcut for this quotient. Therefore if we write it down, it looks like the linear approximation we want. Hence for each point x in i, we first have our constant here plus the whole rest. In other words, here we have x minus x0 times this delta. Now at this point you already know, this looks nice, but it's not so special because we always can do that. Hence we also have to add that we can do this limit process. In fact, this is now what we can translate into a continuity property of this delta function. So the function is continuous at the point x0 if and only if this limit exists. So you see, in the case that we are familiar with the continuity property, we can completely avoid writing this limit down. 
And what we get is the whole definition of f being differentiable at one given point. Importantly, please keep that in mind. This whole thing here is a pointwise property. If it works at one chosen point x0, it does not mean that it also works at another point. Okay, I think that's good enough for today. Let's use the next videos to talk about why all of this is useful. So have a nice day and see you soon.